In this talk, we're going to provide you with a practical understanding of Doppler ultrasound. This is something that I commonly see people struggle with. Um, you know, waveforms can be tricky, but if you understand the basic principles, it's actually not that difficult. We're going to review some basic principles of Doppler, including how to look at waveforms themselves, and then we're going to go through the entire body and go through normal and abnormal Doppler waveforms from head to toe. As always, the goal here is not to memorize little details like numbers. Focus on understanding the basic principles and you'll be ready to look at Doppler cases in no time. So in practical terms, you'll hear people refer to a few different modes of ultrasound. So the first is B mode, and that's what we're seeing here. And B mode stands for brightness mode. This is the normal basic mode that we're used to looking at. It's some people refer to it as grayscale, um, and we're using that to generally look at anatomy. And the bulk of what we're looking at on most ultrasound examinations is just B mode ultrasound. But this talk is about Doppler, so you can also have color Doppler. Um, and that uses Doppler interrogation to show flow in vessels. So here is the portal vein, for example. And then you have spectral Doppler. And spectral Doppler involves interrogating a tiny bit of tissue okay, between these lines here, and we'll talk about that in more detail later. And you get a waveform that represents the flow, and we'll talk about this in detail later. So for now, keep these terms straight. We have B-mode, color Doppler, and spectral Doppler. Okay, but what is Doppler ultrasound? So in simple terms, we're just imaging flow. And the principle that this is based on takes us back to high school physics, the Doppler effect. As a quick reminder, the Doppler effect refers to this principle imaged here. So if you have a frequency of sound that is being emitted from a stationary source, such as this car here on the left, let's say it's emitting a siren, for example, or just noise from the car, the frequency of sound that is emitted is going to be the same in all directions. If it's a moving source, like we have here on the right, where it's moving to the right of this picture, then the frequency that you'll detect or hear on this side of the car versus this side of the car are going to be different. So if the sound source is moving away from you and you're standing here, then the frequency you detect is lower as pictured here. And if you're on this side or standing on this side and the source of sound is moving towards you, you're going to detect a higher frequency. And the common example that is given in these high school physics classes is a car with a siren or like a police car that's uh, driving by you so when it's coming towards you you hear a higher pitch and then as it goes by you you immediately hear a change to a lower pitch and that's the principle of the Doppler effect and so for ultrasound it's a similar principle so if you have moving structures like red blood cells in a vessel for example the red blood cells that are moving towards the probe will return at a higher frequency. And if the red blood cells are moving away from the probe, then they're going to return at a frequency that is lower. So as a result, we can detect flow. And so here again is that color Doppler image that's showing us flow in the portal vein. Essentially, we're sampling each pixel in an interrogated area, and the color is displaying the Doppler shift. The color is basically displaying movement. The color itself is giving us information about the direction, usually red for things moving towards the probe and blue for things moving away from the probe, but that depends on the ultrasound setting. So here you see it's red towards the probe and blue away, and this portal vein is moving in the right or appropriate direction towards the uh, liver. And the intensity of this color relates to the amount of Doppler shift. And you can see the scale here, and the color is different depending on the amount of Doppler shift and the direction. Another type of color Doppler is power Doppler. So again, think of power Doppler as a type of color Doppler. And so it looks like this. 
And notice that there aren't different colors here. So it's a single color and there is a scale. And so power Doppler is more sensitive for detecting flow, but it doesn't provide you or it's not going to provide you with any directional information. Um, there are a few advantages of power Doppler over, over traditional color Doppler. Um, one, as I mentioned, it's more sensitive. Um, it's also less dependent on the Doppler angle, uh, i.e. the angle of the probe to the flow, and we'll talk about that in a bit. And you also won't get aliasing, and we'll talk about that in a bit as well if you don't know what that is. And then, as we mentioned, we have spectral Doppler, and that's what gives you these waveforms that people can sometimes find confusing. And here, you're only sampling a very small volume of tissue. Usually, you're trying to get the center of the vessel, and you're going to get a waveform from that that's showing the Doppler shifts displayed over time. So on the x-axis, we have time, and on the y-axis, we have Doppler shift or velocity, if we calculate the velocity from the Doppler shift. And so this is going to give you information about the direction of flow, the velocity of flow, and the acceleration of flow over time. Let's look at this diagram down here a little bit more closely. So on the left, this is what we're generally going to see when we're uh, looking at spectral Doppler images. So this is the layout here. We have the color Doppler images uh, at the top, a scale in the either top left or top right corner, and then we have our spectral waveform down here at the bottom again. And then if we look at this magnified view of the top half, this outer box here is the color Doppler interrogation region. So we can see the color flow in this particular vessel that's demonstrated in red. It's moving in this direction as per the arrows here. The dotted green lines here are the path of the spectral Doppler beam that's interrogating this. You have an angle indicator in blue. This longer blue line is supposed to be placed down the barrel or long axis of the vessel. And this blue line is used to calculate the velocity uh, within the vessel from the amount of Doppler shift. The angle between the green line and the blue line is called the Doppler angle. So this is the angle between the beam and the vessel direction. That angle should be less than 60 degrees and we'll talk about that and why that is in a bit. In yellow, these two lines in yellow here, this is a sample volume or gate, G-A-T-E, a gate, that's where we're getting the waveform from, so we're producing the waveform from the small amount of tissue between these two yellow lines. Generally, we want that to be in the center of a vessel. And so we're going to go through spectral waveforms in good detail in a bit, but first we need to understand a few basic concepts that apply to Doppler in general, including color and spectral Doppler as well. Um, so for now, just understand that there's color, power that we showed you earlier, and there's also spectral Doppler, and now you know what all these lines are on, on the spectral Doppler image that you're looking at. Okay, so let's talk about this Doppler angle, which refers to the angle between the axis of the beam and the direction of flow. So in order to image a frequency shift or detect flow efficiently, we want to image the vessel or the structure at an appropriate angle. And the optimal Doppler angle is less than 60 degrees. Okay, And instead of memorizing numbers, just understand the basic principle. If this here in white is an ultrasound probe and this here in red is a vessel, this Doppler angle here is 90 degrees. So the vessel is perpendicular to the ultrasound beams coming in this direction here. So this would be a Doppler angle of 90 degrees. The blood in this vessel is not moving towards or away from the probe. We're not going to detect any flow in this vessel as a result. And we're going to get no Doppler signal. In contrast, if the vessel is at this angle, for example, so there's the ultrasound beam down this way, and the vessel here is oriented at about uh, 45 degrees, so less than 60 degrees, we're going to detect movement that is either towards the probe or away from the probe better 
when the vessel is oriented in this direction versus the uh, what we showed you earlier. So if you're going to remember any number here, we want the optimal Doppler angle to be less than 60 degrees, but if this is all confusing, just remember this. We want movement to be towards or away from the probe in order to detect flow. We don't want it to be perpendicular. Okay, a second concept to understand is the scale setting, which has to do with the sampling rate. But think of the scale for Doppler as the range of velocities that are shown. So for spectral Doppler, the scale is the y-axis, and we want it set up so that most of the graph visualizes the waveform. So if the scale is too big or too high, then the waveform in comparison is going to look obviously very small. And if the scale is too low or too small, then we can get flow that's literally off the charts or goes above what we're trying to look at or goes above the scale. And that's what causes what we call aliasing or wraparound artifact. So let's take a look at what that would look like. And so what is aliasing? I know this slide is busy, but we'll go through each of them in turn. So if the velocities are too high for the scale, the velocities that are off the chart are going to wrap around and be shown as negative. But if you look at this example here, we have um, a vessel here um, that is interrogated with color Doppler and there's a spectral Doppler waveform here. And quite literally this arterial flow is so high that it's off the scale and it's wrapping around to the negative side here and it's being displayed uh, in the negative uh, portion here. Um, and if you look at the color, you know, this is all flow that's coming towards the probe, but you see all these little areas that are blue. And those little areas that are blue uh, represent aliasing or wraparound. So that's not actually little areas of flow away from the probe, it's just aliasing artifact or artifact due to the scale being too low. So to conceptualize this, uh, the most common example that people give is uh, the example of taking a video of uh, a video recording of a wheel on a car and it explains why a wheel on a car is obviously going forward when the car is moving forward but on video camera sometimes it looks like the wheel is going backwards and so if we look at this top row here which is labeled real so this is what the wheel is actually doing you can see that the wheel is kind of moving in a clockwise direction so uh, this marker here is pointing to the left, then up, then to the right, then down. So it's rolling kind of in, the, in a clockwise direction. Um, but when we sample it with a video camera, um, which is essentially you know, sampling intermittently, um, if we just look at what we're sampling, so we sample here, then here, then here, if we didn't know what was really happening and we just saw the sampled areas, if we look at the markers, we see that it's pointing left, then it's pointing down, then it's pointing right, and despite the fact that we know the wheel is rotating clockwise, it looks like it's rotating counterclockwise. So it's all just about sampling frequency, and that's what this example illustrates. And remember I mentioned earlier briefly that the scale is essentially a product of sampling rate. And so if the blood flow is too high, Namely, if the frequency shift is more than half of the pulse repetition frequency, so the Doppler shift is more than half of the PRF or pulse repetition frequency, that's when you get aliasing. But don't worry about that. The takeaway is the basic principle of aliasing. What is it and what does it look like on the images? Okay, so now let's get into all the principles that you need to understand in order to look at spectral waveforms. And then we're going to look at normal and abnormal waveforms throughout the body. So, as we mentioned before, we're going to be sampling a small area of tissue as indicated by these parallel lines. And the angle of the vessel is going to be marked with this line here that's down the barrel of the vessel uh, or um, parallel to the vessel itself. And that line is used to calculate the velocity in centimeters per second usually from the amount of Doppler shift. And again, down here now we have our spectral waveform on the y-axis. We have the frequency shift or velocity in centimeters per second once it's converted based on the 
uh, Doppler angle itself. And on the x-axis, of course, we have time. So we're showing the velocity at this interrogated region over time. Okay, but it's important to also realize that at any given point in time, not only is there a velocity that can be kind of um, seen based on this y-axis, but there's also a thickness of this line. And the thickness of the line represents the range of velocities that are being sampled in this area of tissue. Okay, so as you know, velocity in a vessel is not uniform. When we have a normal vessel that has normal flow or laminar flow, the red blood cells in the middle or the center of the vessel are going to travel the fastest as indicated by this longer line. And the ones that are closer to the wall are going to move a bit slower. So if you interrogate a small area of tissue, you're going to have a range of velocities. And that range of velocities or Doppler shifts is again reflected in the thickness of that line. And so as a result of that basic principle, um, we can see different ranges of velocities and different thicknesses of lines in different types of vessels. So let's look at a normal aorta. So if you're interrogating the center of it and the walls are very far away, you're going to have laminar flow in the center that's pretty uniform in velocity. And the thickness of the line that we see in the waveform here should be very low. So notice how thin this representative waveform is in the center of the normal aorta. If we look at other larger, large and medium-sized vessels, things like the carotid artery, for example, you're going to have uh, slightly more variation in velocity in the laminar flow that you're uh, detecting in the center of the vessel. And so as you can see, there's a slightly thicker line here. Okay, and you still see some clear bit underneath it. They call it the window, but don't worry about that. And what if these larger medium vessels had disease in them, or they had stenosis or atherosclerotic disease leading to turbulent flow? Well, that's what's being showed down here in this diseased vessels area here. They're showing turbulent flow. And as a result of turbulent flow, which is illustrated here, you're going to have velocities that are essentially all over the place. Okay, and so as a result, at any given point in time, you're going to have a very thick line. So here you have a very thick line with no kind of clear space underneath it or no window. And so this is what you might see with turbulent flow, say, in a carotid artery um, compared to what we would normally see, which would be a medium-sized vessel like, uh, like this up here. Uh, other small vessels, because they're so small, might also look similar to this. Okay, and so the principle of having diseased vessels that have turbulent flow in them with this uh, uh, kind of thicker line than you would normally expect, that principle is referred to as spectral broadening. Okay, so I'm sure you've heard that term before. Spectral broadening refers to what we just talked about. Okay, so when we look at a waveform, we can extract a few pieces of information from it. Okay, so here is again our vessel with our waveform down here. And based on the waveform itself, we can determine the direction of flow. And the direction of flow at any given time has to do with whether we're seeing the waveform above or below the baseline. So this is the baseline here. And here, all of this flow is above the baseline. So this is all forward or towards the probe or towards the transducer. Okay, not only can we figure out the direction, but we can also see the velocity. And the velocity has to do with, again, the y-axis. So it's how far it is away from the baseline itself. And the thickness of the line, as we mentioned, is the range of velocities uh, that we're interrogating at any given point in time. So we can see the direction, we can see the velocity. And we also get information about the acceleration, which has to do with the slope of the curve. Okay? And so if you had to go through and think about all of these things for every single case, it might sound a little involved, 
But in real practice, these things, one, become second nature, and two, vessels have characteristic normal waveforms. So if we understand the basic principles and know what the characteristic normal waveforms look like in different areas of the body, we can figure out what's abnormal very quickly. And by the end of this talk, you'll have a good understanding of what those characteristic waveforms look like and what abnormal looks like. Okay? But before we go over those principles and the principle of characteristic waveforms, there's one other basic concept that you need to understand, and that's the principle of the resistive index. Okay, and the resistive index is a calculation based on the end systolic velocity and end diastolic velocity, noted by S for systolic and D for diastolic. Okay, and we have the formula for resistive index up here. And so it's the systolic velocity minus the end diastolic velocity over the uh, peak systolic or, or systolic velocity, sorry. The sonographer, when it's important, will calculate the resistive index for you. Um, but what's more important is the principle of what various resistive indices or various uh, a, a particular resistive index means. And so the resistive index, or RI, is a measurement of the resistance of the vascular bed distal to the interrogated vessel. Okay, so that's what we're measuring. And in normal conditions in most arteries that we're interrogating, the resistive index is going to be less than 1. And so what does that mean? What does less than 1 mean? Well, if you look at the formula, it just means that there is going to be some end diastolic flow that is in a forward direction that's above 0. Okay, If you had a positive systolic flow, systolic velocity, and you have a positive diastolic velocity, then obviously this is going to be a uh, number that's less than 1. Um, and so all a resistive index less than 1 means that you have forward end diastolic flow. So the resistive index here, for example, is 0.71, and that suggests that we have end diastolic uh, uh, velocity that's above uh, 0, and we have forward end diastolic flow. What if you had no end diastolic flow? So if you had no end diastolic flow or end diastolic velocity was zero, then D would be zero in this formula, so the resistive index would be one. So a resistive index of one means no end diastolic flow. If you had reversed end diastolic flow, so in a very high resistance situation, D would be negative, and as a result, the RI, this whole formula, would be over 1. So if Ri is above 1, then we have reversed end diastolic flow. So clearly you can see that as we go from less than 1 to 1 to above 1, we're moving from a lower resistance situation where things are still moving forward to a very high resistance or the highest resistance situation where uh, there's no longer forward flow uh, at the end of uh, diastole, but in fact eventually there's reversed end diastolic flow. So that's the basic principle to understand here is the resistive index itself, but also what it means. And so the higher numbers mean more resistance distal to the interrogated vessel, and a lower RI means less resistance distal to the interrogated vessel. Okay, and so now that we understand the basic principles of waveforms, let's start to understand what they look like in the body by learning some very basic principles. So certain vessels in the body need to be low resistance or have a low RI, okay? And these are arteries that are supplying organs that need to be perfused pretty much all the time. So these are organs that are always on. Things like the brain, the liver, the kidneys, and for pregnant patients, the placenta. So arteries that are feeding these organs are going to have low resistance or a low RI. In other words, they're going to have a lot of end diastolic flow because we want to keep supplying these things. And so the top picture here is showing you an example of a low resistance waveform. So you see it's an arterial waveform with a quick upstroke, and we still have end diastolic flow that is positive. Obviously, as we showed last time, the resistive index, or RI, is going to be well below 
1. And so this is what waveforms are going to look like for arteries that are feeding the brain, the liver, the kidneys, and the placenta, something like this. And then we have certain organs or certain parts of the body that need intermittent blood supply or on-demand blood supply. So at baseline, when you're resting, for example, they are going to be high resistance. We don't want to shunt blood there um, and waste it when we want to pump it towards the brain, the liver, the kidneys, etc. that need it all the time. So for example, your femoral arteries don't need to constantly be pumping lots of blood to your legs, so it's a high resistance waveform. And then if you go for a run or something and you need a lot of blood there, then it can change to become lower resistance. But at rest, when we ultrasound patients, things like the femoral artery, the facial artery, the SMA are going to be relatively high resistance waveforms and they're going to have a high RI. Okay, and so these, or this example here, is an example of a high resistance waveform. And you can see we have arterial flow again here. And at the end of diastole, we don't have any, or very much, or any forward or backward end diastolic flow. So this is an RI of about one. This is a high resistance type of waveform. So that's the key principle here is that based on this principle, you can kind of understand or know which waveforms are going to look, are going to normally have a low resistive index and which ones are going to normally have a high resistive index and have a, uh, a picture that looks like this. Okay, so now one of the most common things that we diagnose using Doppler in a number of clinical situations is vessel stenosis. So we see it in carotid arteries and renal arteries and liver transplant arteries, etc. So how do we know if there's stenosis? How do we make the diagnosis of stenosis? If you understand the basic principles that we've gone over and that we're going to go over here, it's pretty intuitive. So the signs of stenosis depend on where you image in relationship to the stenosis. Okay, so this is a very important point. So this particular slide is probably one of the most important or if not the most important of this entire talk. Um, so first let's go through the vocabulary. So upstream refers to blood that hasn't gone through the stenosis yet. Downstream blood refers to blood that's after a stenosis. Okay. And the signs of stenosis depend on where you're imaging or what portion of the vessel in relationship to the stenosis that you're interrogating. Okay, and so there are direct and indirect signs, but essentially uh, the most common or one of the more common signs that people talk about is a direct sign that is actually at the location of the stenosis itself. So at the location of the stenosis itself, you end up getting an increase in peak systolic velocity, okay? Because the same amount of flow has to get through a tighter spot, so obviously the velocity has to increase. So you get an increase in peak systolic, increase in peak systolic velocity at the location of the stenosis itself, okay? Just distal to the stenosis, you start getting turbulent flow. And as we showed you earlier, when you have turbulent flow, you start to get spectral broadening. So as a direct result of the stenosis, you have a high peak systolic velocity at the stenosis and spectral broadening just distal due to turbulent flow. And then you have indirect signs, and those are just as important uh, on ultrasound. And so upstream, if you were to interrogate, if you're pumping into a relative blockage, then you're going to have a higher resistance or a higher resistance waveform with a higher RI. So upstream, you'll notice this is a high resistance type waveform, a relatively high resistance type waveform. And then downstream, if you were to image, so distal to the stenosis, you're going to get what's called a tardis parvus waveform that looks something like this. And so what's this tardis parvus waveform? Well, 
Quite literally, TARDIS means slow, um, referring to a slow upstroke. Think of it as tardy, like late, so the peak comes later. Okay, and this can be quantified like it is here, so a time to peak that's longer than a certain amount of time. But just understand the principle and what it looks like. You don't have a quick upstroke, and it looks something like this. So this is a normal waveform here, normal arterial waveform with brisk and quick upstroke. Okay, and you see that at time to peak, or TTP is what they call it, time to peak, is relatively short. It's a, uh, the slope is also higher. And then in this upstream stenosis, or tardis parvus waveform, you'll notice that is, it's a slower um, upstroke here, and the time to peak is longer. So the TARDIS, again, refers to a slow upstroke like this. And the PARVIS refers to a weak amplitude. Okay, so the peak isn't very high. And so when you're actually working and you're trying to identify a TARDIS PARVIS waveform in practice, there's a couple things that you're going to look for, and that includes the subjective things you're looking for and the objective things you're looking for. And first and, and probably most important is you just have to get used to the appearance of the TARDIS PARVIS waveform as we uh, just reviewed. And then you can also objectively quantify it with the time to peak, again a longer time to peak because of the slow upstroke. And you can also get a low RI or a low resistive index um, distal to uh, stenosis and well. And some people think that this is a little bit confusing or um, you know, it's a little bit counterintuitive. Why do you have a low RI if you, you're talking about stenosis? But remember, it's all about where you are, where you're imaging in relationship to the stenosis. So if you were imaging upstream, you would have a high RI because there's resistance that is high that's distal to that upstream measurement. But in this situation, when we see this TARDIS parvus waveform, we're specifically talking about distal to the stenosis. So it's already been through the high resistance area. And if you think about it, if other tissue that's even more distal to what we're interrogating is hungry for blood because of the upstream stenosis, the capillary beds are going to dilate and you know they're hungry for blood. And as a result, you're going to have actually lower resistance in this area uh, more distally. And so don't get too bogged down with that if it doesn't make any sense. Just understand what TARDIS parvus is and where you expect to see it uh, downstream uh, of the stenosis. So let's review this again. So this is, again, the most important thing in this talk, probably. Understand this principle and burn what's on this slide into your brain. So again, we're looking for stenosis. So for example, in a renal artery transplant, for example, we're looking at the renal artery. And we're going to interrogate the renal artery at different locations. And so upstream from a stenosis, if we were to interrogate here, we're going to have a high resistance appearance of the waveform and high RIs that are above 0 0.7 or so. At the stenosis itself, you're going to have very high peak systolic velocities. And again, depending on what you're looking at, um, in general, it's usually around 200 centimeters per second um, for uh, some of the vessels that we often image in the body. Um, but we'll talk about that in our specific examples later. And then if we image downstream of, of a stenosis, we might see a TARDIS parvus waveform. And again, this is that example. So slow, upstroke, and weak and you'll also notice that the RI, or resistive index, uh, is quite low here as well. So if you don't understand this principle and the principles that we're displaying here, it's probably important to pause the video, read it about it online, or re-watch this segment. This is an important concept, as I've said a couple times. If you do understand this, awesome. We've made it through the basic principles, and it's time to get... Uh, a little bit more clinical. Okay, now it's time for the fun part. So we're going to go from head to toe, look at characteristic normal waveforms, and then show you examples of the most common pathologies that you're going to diagnose with spectral waveforms.
We're going to apply the principles that we've learned so far in real clinical situations in the carotid arteries, renal vessels, liver vessels, including making sense of portal vein and hepatic vein waveforms, and a few other high yield locations. The clinical stuff is what's going to give you the confidence to know what you're doing when you see a spectral waveform in any place in the body. And to get all this, please tune in to part two of this talk. Thanks.